For people just starting their career, I have a bit of a different advice. I think a lot of people say, go start your own company, learn by doing. I highly don't recommend that route. I would recommend most people, they actually go see what good looks like. And that doesn't necessarily, part where I would talk about prestige is that like, just because something prestigious doesn't mean the right place that you're gonna learn the most from. The thing that might've made that prestige might no longer still be relevant because the people who were there that got it to that state might not be as involved. It might be a much larger company, might be a lot more process. It's very much about, I would say, go look for the smartest people you can surround yourself with and try to work there. And don't just do like little flavor one year at a multiple companies Like you really want to understand something from first principles, which really requires spending multiple years trying to work through some hard problem. You definitely want to try to look for places that already had some level of success and you're going to continue to build on a level of success. The reason I call that out is because there's some pretty interesting companies with smart people that seem smart from the outside. And as a 22 year old or when you're young, it's hard to evaluate like what is smart or not smart because everyone's smarter than you. Hi, I'm Karthik. I'm the CEO at Sift. At Sift, we're building the data tools to go build modern machines. And a lot of it is inspired by workflows and processes and how we built machines back at SpaceX, where I spent the prior four and a half years before working on the Dragon flight software program. And Dragon was a capsule that carried astronauts and cargo to the space station. So we have uh, seven publicly announced customers. We raised about 25 million. Most recently, the Series A was led by GV, that's Google Ventures. Previous our seed was led by two firms in LA, Clica Ventures, focuses on a lot of enterprise SaaS. A Riot Venture is one of the best like hardware investing firms. I was born and raised in a little suburb outside of LA, right next to JPL. So I was about 10, 15 minutes outside of JPL. So I actually grew up going to industry days where you can just walk in. There's a lot of photos of me actually with like playing with the Mars Rover and the Legos and stuff that they had at JPL. I would always grew up with Legos, but then like my first real like machines were Lego Mindstorms. You can build little robots and you can make very simple programs with these Legos. I started that around nine, so I was like fourth grade. Always had fun with that with my friends. And I also did this thing called First Lego League. So First Robotics, they have these competitions it's most known for the high schoolers that are building like these robots that'll have like they'll be like three on three and they'll have some sort of like theme saying like hey we're building a moon base so you have to build a robot that can go drive around on a slick floor the floor will be all whiteboard material and the wheels you have to use are basically like a whiteboard material so it's like super slippery and we'll have some sort of competition we have to like move these massive balls into a net whatever it is but they also have younger levels it's lego based so that was kind of my background i was like around engineering but it wasn't like a hardcore engineering like stem background it was like i had exposure but i had a lot of freedom to do other things there's a little bit more nuance that i knew that the whole like paypal mafia so basically during undergrad that's when peter thiel came out with zero to one so that book zero to one i liked it a lot kind of more contrarian very much promoting first principles thinking of that i was looking at more of like the paypal mafia companies but paypal was also like much later stage i, I didn't think it was the paypal in the early days but a lot of these other companies so like palantir spacex tesla were really interesting so that's what i was looking at as opposed to like the prestigious companies i actually would as part of advice, I would highly recommend people not optimizing for prestige. Do you know the etymology of the word prestige? The etymology of the word prestige is actually, it goes back to like the French word for illusion. And then it goes back to the Latin word for playing tricks, conjuring tricks. The whole concept of like prestige, you know, in a prestigious place, actually a bit of an illusion. You just want to go to places that are like, have results. Like you can like see, people say it's great, but you can actually see with your own eyes on the ground truth. With SpaceX, that was clearly visible. Are you a tech startup founder building something cool? If so, listen up. EO has teamed up with .tech Domain to give founders like you a rare opportunity to pitch live directly to top VCs in Silicon Valley and get featured on this channel, viewed by more than 350K subscribers worldwide. The only condition, your startup must use a .tech Domain or plan to upon getting selected to pitch and have raised less than $3 million in funding. After all, if you're building in tech, that tech is the most relevant domain extension to get. It tells the world your website is all about technology, and hey, it's cooler than a .com. Some of the coolest tech startups are already using .tech domains, and we've been highlighting their stories in EO's original interview series, Beyond Tech. Now, it's your turn. Head over to www.pitch.tech or check the video description to apply now. I joined SpaceX. There is a lot of stuff to learn. One of the Dragon missions, as it was coming back to Earth, the Dragon capsule has four parachutes. One of the four parachutes, it didn't open until a pretty low altitude. Of course, there's redundancy built in. It was always going to be safe, even though that parachute didn't open. It wasn't an expected behavior. And the way that this works is these Dragon missions work on the scheduling is as soon as you bring these four astronauts back, you want to launch another four immediately to get back on the space station. Our scheduled next launch was actually just one week behind. But then NASA said, hey, this parachute didn't open. How do we know this is not going to be a, a more 
more problematic issue on the next mission. And then they grounded the next flight until there's a result. For us to actually figure out what was happening, we need to see all the data that was collected from the vehicle, but it's stored on this like black box on the vehicle, just like I was an airplane has like this black box that stores all the data. And the thing is that this capsule, it lands in the Gulf of Mexico. You don't have internet connection in the Gulf of Mexico to go debug this. So at that time, Starlink was like a very experimental program. So we like shot over an email to the Starlink team and we're like, hey, is there any way we can get internet over the Gulf of Mexico? They activated some cells over the Gulf of Mexico, upload this data from the Dragon capsule while it was sailing. This is before like Starlink was a thing. So like getting high throughput internet in the middle of the ocean is not heard of. We're able to send all the data back to the headquarters. We were able to run it through the whole testing suite, do all the analysis, basically say that the next mission is good to go. It's very interesting. You have very smart people that are basically able to coordinate satellites to beam internet when it was a very experimental program to go accelerate your physical spacecraft company at the time. So I think that was just like a very cool experience. I think the biggest things I learned was just seeing what good looks like, which I know is like very broad because I actually noticed you were asking the question earlier about what advice would you give? And I think one of the things is just learning from the smartest folks. And at SpaceX, I just saw a lot of people that were operating at a very high level. And sure, you can criticize that like maybe certain things in like management might not be what everyone else likes. But at the end of the day, you see it with your eyes. It's like the largest rocket ever launched and brought back and landing until you, you can like push the boundary and like show people things that have never been possible. And then you're like super proud of the work you do. You work really, really hard, but then you can look back and you're like super proud of what you do. And I think the key learning was just how to operate at that very high level. The things that stood out of operating that high level, a lot of it is just urgency. So it's just like high urgency, high iteration rate. You learn the most if you just have that urgency to move fast. It was mostly I just wanted to see what good looked like. So I was interviewing companies I thought were really high performing. At that time, this is what, 2017-ish? When I decided to join SpaceX, I was just pretty much looking for learning from very, very high performing companies. Because I knew eventually I'd either be running a company or starting a company or be in a high leadership position. Let me go see how it was done by the best. So I was interviewing companies I thought were very, very high performing at that time. Stripe was one of the hot companies at that time. Palantir was like really interesting at the time. I just wanted to learn from people who were doing well. What stood out about SpaceX, like the interview process was just very different than every other company. Nobody was pitching me on benefits. No one was pitching me on like work-life balance. They were pitching me on mission and the work that you're doing here. It was a lot more Spartan, but it's also something you can look back on and be very excited about. And you can like point to something great that you accomplished with a, another team that was grinding very hard. That was the main reason why I chose it. So while I was there, I learned a lot about how to build machines that are safer, more reliable, fault tolerant. I wanted to bring a lot of those ideas and practices to wider industry of people building machines. That's why we actually started SIFT to productize some of this knowledge into tools for the rest of the hardware industry. I see SIFT growing and like the vision that I would have for it or my goal. I want a percentage of the physical world to be operating on SIFT. I want at least a percent of the trains, the planes, the automobiles, the drones, the aircraft, things that are out there. I want those operating on SIFT, whether they're being designed, whether they're being manufactured. If they're out in the field, they're generating data, they need to be maintained. There should be at least a percentage of the physical world running on SIFT. The process for acquiring SIFT's first customer was actually kind of novel. We actually just rented space, Parallel Systems' office. They're the autonomous rail company. They were our first customer. They have a pretty cool office, and we literally just asked them if we can rent one of the rooms as we build out the product. And that was just motivated by, at SpaceX, Elon always wanted the engineer on the factory floor. So we said, we should just be embedded with our customers. Let's go rent a room. And then as we built the product, we had new features. We just go grab someone else in the office and say, what do you think of this? What do you want? What do you not like? Our early roadmap was completely driven by them. The evolution of our sales motion to the next first few customers. It was a lot of it was like using things in network. We were lucky that there is vibrant SpaceX alum community. We also were able to reach out through existing investors or investors that were generally interested in SIF uh, for introductions and also just even just reaching out on LinkedIn, talking about this stuff that we solved, what we want to do, showing a product. But then also we had a competitor started around the same time as us. We actually had a few of those bake offs in the early days. The other companies knew that there was a bunch of customers due to their multiple companies in the space invited us to a bake off because it definitely added a lot of urgency on our team. And we won all the bake offs that we've done to date. That was actually a bit of a novel experience, I would say, compared to most companies. I think some of the biggest lessons I've learned is that like it really all just comes down to people. You have one life to live, like spend it with the people you want to be around. There's a lot of urgency. I have very, very limited time. If I'm going to go spend my time with someone, I want it to be the best person I can spend that time with. And that goes into everything, whether that's work, whether that's personal. So choosing the best partner or that. Everything that you do is just informed by the people that are into that. At the end of the day, like SIFT, you can talk about all this tech, you can talk, talk about this architecture, you can talk about all this cool stuff that we do, even our backgrounds or whatever, but it really just comes down to people. Without the people we have at SIFT, we wouldn't have the company of SIFT. Make sure you bring together the best team, create opportunities for everyone to grow, keep everyone happy to be there. And that's the main lesson I learned.
And that's actually a big thing I would call out because a lot of the audience here probably, it looks cool to get some person that's like, oh, the CEO or that person who has like a really high profile, sounds really prestigious, get them as advisors. But if they're not vested in your success significantly, they're not going to be actually helping you. They're not going to be doing interviews. They're not going to help you in the trenches. And you need to get people who are going to do that. And in that process, they're going to challenge you and get the smartest folks around. So the best way to evaluate what is a good team or smart team, honestly, is just to kiss a lot of frogs. Maintaining that talent bar and looking for people who want to do something challenging that they can be proud of, they're going to work hard and they can think around like the same level or smarter than you even better for people just starting their career i have a bit of a different advice like i think a lot of people say go start your own company learn by doing i highly don't recommend that route i would recommend most people they actually go see what good looks like and that doesn't necessarily part where i would talk about prestige is that like just because something's prestigious doesn't mean that it's like the right place that you're going to learn the most from the thing that might have made that prestige might no longer still be relevant because the people who were there that got into that state might not be as involved it might be a much larger company it might be a lot more process it's very much about I would say go look for the smartest people you can surround yourself with and try to work there and don't just do like little flavor one year at multiple companies like you really want to understand something from first principles which really requires spending multiple years trying to work through some hard problem you definitely want to try to look for places that already had some level of success and you're going to continue to build on a level of success the reason I call that out is because there's some pretty interesting companies with smart people that seem smart from the outside as a 22 year old or when you're young it's hard to evaluate like what is smart or not smart because everyone's smarter than you you want to be careful to not go somewhere spend a decade and if that company shuts down you don't know what that company did that was successful or not successful that's why it's good to go to a place that has like some level of success that has momentum and it's continuing to grow so like spacex was really awesome in that regard they were actually around the time i landed was the first time the falcon heavy was launched they already had rocket falcon 9 rockets that were launching they already had the dragon one program but there's still a lot more there they were planning on doing they weren't just like sitting and resting that's what i would optimize for the reason i call that the prestige is like i would completely remove the prestige like you really want to do that go do that the reason i call that out is because a lot of times people will go into that career purely for the sake of the thing like it looks cool you can go tell your aunts about it but are you going to learn as much are you doing like hard skills are you actually working on the problem or are you completely abstracted away are you just multiplying the grunt work that's being done so like are you actually going to ownership of things or are you just like being the grunt work multiplier for someone else that's more senior so the reason i recommend people to join a company doing something hard and like seeing what grade looks like it's very difficult to strive for greatness if you've never seen what greatness looks like cool you can go watch as many podcasts podcast as you want you can go see what some blog posts but it's kind of like instagram right you only see the best of someone's life you only see like a very curated version that's in like a blog post but what were the decisions that got the company to that place what were the nine failures they had for that one success that's what you learn by actually solving hard problems you don't get that by spending one two years at like six companies and then saying i'm gonna do an mba and then go start a company for example you just really have to work deeply on a hard problem with smart folk and a hard problem by the way can be different problems like you don't necessarily have to go build rockets even just like growing like a software startup there's a lot of challenges in building that company honestly like i don't think it's a complete reflection on the other person not being smart i think it's just a, what's the right role for the person like for somebody to join your company it's like it's a pretty big risk it might be very different than somewhere else that they've been very successful at someone who might have been very very successful like a salesforce they might struggle in a like, much earlier stage role like i wouldn't hold it against them it's just a process like don't feel as bad about it everyone does it everyone struggles everyone finds it hard but as we were talking about iteration rate you want to kiss more frogs you'll see what's good what's not a lot faster than sitting there trying to grind through a bad decision. the best things that I learned while working at SpaceX. Very, very strong focus on first principles thinking. You can just keep asking why. A lot of times people push something off and they say, oh, well, we're waiting for this person before we have that meeting. Is something scheduled for two weeks from now? And it's like, well, why does that person even have to be in the meeting? What can we go around and still move? Let's say something's not working instead of just saying like, oh, that's not working because it's just broken or it's like a thing that you can't do. Like people say you can't land rockets. It's like, why? Why can't you land a rocket? We fly and land planes all the time. People are like, oh, because of this or this technical reason. And it's like, well, it's not actually blocked by physics it's just that nobody's ever done it before basically you keep asking why till the point physics is the reason you can't do it i think that's what i would consider first principles but it applies everywhere it's like i think a lot of times we have a tendency to just say oh the hardware team says we can't do this it's like well who on the hardware team and you go talk to that person you realize they actually can do it but it's just like some other thing that they also need and if you as long as you get that then you can actually get this thing a lot faster there's actually this plays into a lot of like risk as well werner von braun who used to run nasa back in the during the apollo era he noticed 
notice that, let's say some engineer identified a risk and then they told their manager about it, the manager would downplay that risk. It would go from saying, oh, this is fatal when you stop the mission to the manager saying, hey, this is a really high risk. That person's manager says, oh, we need to go look into this. By the time it reaches Werner von Braun, he would actually just basically someone who says, oh, everything's good to go. He actually implemented this thing called like weekly notes. So what he would do is he had every individual engineering squad or team write notes and his team would compile them into a book and he would actually review all of them. So he basically sees ground truth and he can actually make decisions from first principles about what's holding up the program. And basically that's how we put a person on the moon. Those rockets probably have the compute power of like a TI-84 calculator. You can do some pretty cool things when you actually dig into why.